Hi hey YouTube, Sad Womble here. I've just been wondering how long it will be before feminism, which is basically just an interest group that got wildly out of control, actually collapses under its own weight. The primary example of this, which funnily enough is also one of the primary drivers for societal change, is the education system. Certainly in the UK, uh, the education system in from from basically from primary school but especially in universities and colleges is very very geared up to women's issues there are courses that specifically women go for such as you know women's studies gender issues and other so-called soft subjects rather than the hard subjects um, such as physics maths and things like that but the subjects are irrelevant for this, this conversation. Basically, any interest group can exist in society as long as it is only a small part of society that's doing the, that's doing the discussing. Um, society as a whole functions. Uh, within that, you will always have pressure groups and interest groups who have their particular agenda. We have you know, in the UK, well, certainly well, worldwide, you have the campaign for nuclear disarmament, a group of people who thought nuclear weapons were a bit of a bad idea, and they went around holding rallies, making a noise, and, you know, they had, they put their pressure on, but on the whole, basically, I mean, the people were agreed that, you know, nuclear weapons were generally a bad thing, so nuclear weapons didn't prolif proliferate. Um, you will always have vegetarians who will say, meat is murder, you know, everyone's got to live off lentils. Um, you will have people who say, no one should ever have a pet in the home. Animals should be allowed to fly free in the world. And that's all very fine and pleasant, and every pressure group has a right to exist. That's what a free society is all about. The problem we have with feminism, and as I say, specifically in this instance regarding the, um, the world of academia, is because... Um, colleges and universities are basically packed full of women friendly programs helping hands for women to do this and women to do that as well as the whole general method of teaching which is women friendly men and boys traditionally do well at the high risk concept of one big exam at the end um, that's which is how you know first past the post system whereas girls traditionally do well at anything that's when you break something into lots of small steps and do continual assessment. Uh, this has led to, um, because you know, girls, girls were seen as a failing group, certainly in the, in the 90s and beyond, the whole of academia in the UK was really turned on its head and turned into a female-friendly continual assessment system. And for a while that was fine, but of course what we now see is women outpacing men at just about everything. Okay. So we can, we've, we're starting to see the damage this is doing to society, as, as in one of my previous conversations. Um, women who now have the purse strings to look after themselves turn around and look at every man that basically isn't Johnny Depp or Brad Pitt and find them wanting. But the, the bigger picture for me, certainly for universities, is that you have a university, basically you have to have, you have men and you have women at a university. And the university obviously has a budget. Now, it must cost money to run all these women's programs. And that's all very fine and pleasant and lovely. But what do you do? Obviously, you have the, the men going into universities and the women going into university. And the men who don't have all these programs, which is another conversation, and I think, basically, I don't think either side should have them. I think either both sides have them, which makes a total mockery of everything. Because if you help everybody then you're not helping anyone because, you know, it's like if everybody is given five pounds or five dollars, well, everybody is five pounds richer, this is true, but then prices will go up because all the shopkeepers know that everyone's got an extra five dollars. So it's better not to give anyone that and everyone's still on a level playing field and it's fine. But my point is, if you subsidise one side to a huge amount, you have to get it from somewhere and, of course, you get it from the side that doesn't need it. Um, and with the huge increase of women into, into education, which I have no problem with as a concept, 
if you um, basically as fewer and fewer men go on basically you're going to end up with universities with you know 10 men and you know 2,000 women in it and who's going to pay for all these self-help groups and soon universities are going to find themselves unable to pay for all these self-help groups and they're going to start to get withdrawn or fees are going to go up or men are going to say well you know you're charging larger and larger amounts and I'm getting less and less for it you know I'm watching my classroom you know here I am sitting in a classroom you know four blokes and and 20 women 30 women 40 women they are all getting help to beat me where's my help because the men are becoming the minority and of course there's two ways that society can handle this or academia can society can deal with this and it's basically that academia can either withdraw it from the women well that's going to work really well because women are known for uh, accepting the logic of um, that they've got too much and that they've got to give something back that's a that's a well-known personality trait and if you can't detect sarcasm you're not the uh, followers that i think you are um or they can start to give it to the men as well. And as I've just said, what is the point of helping everyone? You may as well, I mean, that's what tutors are for. If you have a problem, you go and see the tutor and the tutor helps you. That's, that's what academia has been like forever. If you've got a problem, you go and see teacher. And that's true from primary school right up the top. And of course, this isn't just in, in universities, in the workplace. Uh, it's all very fine to say we are going to give uh, women a year off for maternity pay. That's a very, very noble thing because we want to encourage women into the workplace. That's fine when you've got a workforce of 400 people and two women. That's great. If you make the workforce uh, more family friendly, you haven't just got to support those two women for a year paying them their salary suddenly you've got to support four women, six women, eight women. And at some point you hit critical mass. Now, businesses businesses are not known for being altruistic businesses are, have to be forced to be altruistic and this is perfectly fine and pleasant and lovely because business businesses have one function in life and that is to make money uh, and any business that makes money has one other function in life and that is to make more money and the plain and simple fact is that if you are an underperforming employee you're going to be shown the door now, what's the definition of an underperforming employee? Usually, it would be an employee who's not pulling their weight. Yeah, how, how does that equate to someone who doesn't come to work for a year and still gets paid? Now, by my standards, that counts as an underperforming employee. Let me try, as a man, if I just phone up my boss and go, you know what, I'm not coming in for a year. Let's see how, um, how my boss handles that. I have a tiny suspicion that my boss will go, well, that's absolutely fine, uh, you're sacked. And I wouldn't blame my employer for doing that. But this is exactly what women do. They get pregnant, which is a choice issue, with um, abortion, certainly in the UK, being um, more available than ever and available on the National Health Service. In other words, if a woman finds herself pregnant and it's inconvenient for her to be pregnant, she um, can get an abortion, uh, which and I have total no problem with people having access to that kind of facility but this proves that pregnancy is actually a choice if i choose to go out today and try and buy myself a bugatti veyron which is an extremely expensive car if i did that and therefore had to remortgage my house and do all sorts of things to afford it and then couldn't eat or afford my house because i have made this incredibly huge purchase i do not expect to be assisted by somebody else for my stupid decision. The Bugatti Veyron may have been, and it may be an absolutely awesome car, and I may love it, love it dearly. Uh, and it may have seemed like a fantastic idea down the line, but it's, it may well, if I can afford it, that's totally fine. If I can't afford it, it was a stupid thing to do. And so it goes on with pregnancy. If you choose to have a child, you have a, you have a responsibility, a financial responsibility. I'm of the mind that it is not society at large, it is not society's um, job to pay for someone else's decisions. I didn't say mistakes, I said decisions. If you choose to have a child, that's fine, providing you can support it. There is a groundswell, certainly along the, uh, among the, 
the lower paid members of society that it's their right to have children and it is their right to have children it's just not their right that everybody else has to pay for it I am an only child I was born in the 70s my parents were nicely off they had enough money they couldn't afford two children though I remain an only child because my family couldn't afford to um, and that's absolutely fine it just annoys me and it's it, that, that, that people will say well it's my right to do this so you have to pick up the tab and I just don't think that's the case it is your right to do something but you have to live with the choices you make just as it is somebody's right to go to university that's fine but it is not their right certainly if they are female or if they're male to expect preferential treatment academia throughout history has been for th for free thinkers for people to stand up and say I've got this idea and it doesn't matter how insane it is I'm going to give a talk on it and people come along and they listen and if they approve of it they go away and they take away a new world view and maybe that'll affect them and maybe it won't and if they don't approve of it they listen and they go oh well that was a load of old cobblers and they walk away and they ignore it and that's how it should be academia should be a world of free thinking now certainly from what I've seen it um, from memory it from uh, various videos on on a voice for men and girl rights what there are I think it's, you think it's the University of Toronto basically you have all the feminists um, doing all doing their level best to disrupt any um, men's rights conversations and any men's rights talks that get put on to the point of they were um, the University of Toronto requested um, special payments from the people who are putting on the talks which again goes against uh, the concept of free speech which is at the heart of any democracy which amuses me no end because can you imagine if the roles are reversed and women wanted to have their say and men didn't didn't just I have no problem with protesting outside but we don't we, but, but it, it's the way you you cross the line when you actively stop things happening when you bar people from entering when you do things that will actually disrupt the talk is that that's where you cross the line and the the thing that amuses me even more specifically about the, the feminist movement is that their view is that the patriarchy is all-powerful and that there is no such thing as any form of need for a men's rights movement because um, men have already got it they've already got it made it's already sorted um, in which case you would think that they would let people listen to the um, the men's rights information because in their view it's a completely pointless thing and certainly isn't it better to have somebody wasting their time on a pointless pursuit than wasting their th than using their time to actually do something that will cause something isn't it better to, this is the feminist view is wouldn't well it's not the feminist view it's the it's the view you would think they would have but they don't wouldn't you think it would be better letting people have their incorrect views you know that they need a men's rights movement and all that rather than you know actively campaigning against feminism which is not what the men's rights movement does the men's rights movement is you know the clue is in the title um, the men's rights movement wants nothing more and nothing less than you know equal rights for men I may have I may be paraphrasing and if somebody wants to correct me that's that's absolutely fine please do and if they if I've really messed up I will take this video down but you have to prove to me that I'm wrong before I'll do that um, you know the, the the general thing that men all men all men's rights movements want is they want to be heard they want to be listened to and they want the uh, and they want equal rights and they genuinely want equal rights this isn't the equal rights that feminism wants which basically is if you've got it I want it uh, if you've got it and you've worked for it I still want it uh, because um, I haven't got it now if you haven't got it you can work for it if working for it means badgering somebody else until they give it to you that does not count as working for it hammering on someone's door demanding not only that they turn the music down but that they give you their stereo and then you take it into your house and turn the noise up 
and when they hammer on your door, you say, well, it's my right to listen to the music go away, which is basically what feminism does, is just plain wrong. And that is what men's rights are basically fighting for. They're fighting for everyone that wants one to have a stereo, but that everyone who has a stereo should use it responsibly. And if it's too loud, should be asked to turn the music down and should have a genuine expectation that the music will be turned down. Simplistic? Possibly. But then it's a very simple fact. To exist in society, we all have to get along. Everyone has to make compromises. No one, and I mean no one, can have it all. Sad Womble, out.